<laughs> well, uh, this presentation is titled Unlocking New Platform Experiences with Open Interfaces. And I'm here with Thomas to talk a little bit about different tools that you can use uh, if you are building platforms. How do you combine them together? And how can you uh, face some interesting challenges while doing so, right? So let's yes, let's get started. Let's, let's go right into it. Like, we will not spend time on crazy stuff, right? So challenges that you will face when you're building platforms or dealing with a bunch of teams working with Kubernetes clusters and infrastructure and all that stuff. Let's start with the first challenge. The first challenge, onboarding process, right? How do you get people in newer teams to get faster, to use all these crazy tools together? It gets complicated because, again, the amount of tools that you will need is pretty large. And each tool has been designed with different use cases in mind, so you kind of like need to learn all of them in order to be effective with them. So we need to do something about it, right? The second challenge is that you're building distributed systems, so how can you uh, reduce the cognitive load around like developers building these more complicated systems that needs to be resilient from the get-go and that they just need to scale in some way or another, right? Because your business will do good, so you need to be able to scale them and do that. And finally, how do you run this and how do you operate this in your production environments? How do you do promotion across environments and how do you do you know, the things that you need to do with your applications, like observe them and figure out what's going wrong when things are not working as expected, right? Yeah. So let's start uh, with a very simple application. I presented this this application at App Developer Con this year uh, with the Dagger folks. I don't know if you know them, but uh, what we show here is that even for very, very simple architectures, uh, things get complicated really, really fast. So this is like an application that uh, was published by Docker, Docker folks uh, to show how to containerize applications using different languages and using different infrastructure, right? Simple application to cast the vote and then see the results yeah. while the data is being, you know, uh, aggregated by the worker service. In this case, we're using Java, C Sharp, and Go, just a very polyglot environment. All of these things will need to be containerized and deployed into Kubernetes cluster. But then you have the infrastructure layer also that you, know, you need to take care of. And uh, we will take a look into how to deal with that as well. So yeah. let's it, have a look at how it works. Let's take a look at the application. Like the application is, is pretty simple and it looks like this, right? So you can uh, cast votes and you can uh, actually see the results that are changing, right? So pretty simple stuff, very basic. Again, we want to show a simple application working. Uh, and uh, yes, the architecture around that application too. So we'll use this to exemplify the challenges that we mentioned at the beginning, like the onboarding side, the distributed system patterns and tools that you can use around that space, and then the operation, you know, running in production space too. So my name is Mauricio Salatino, I'm a software engineer, I work for a company that's called Diagrid. We are doing, uh, you know, Dapper, and I'm working on also on the K-18 project. I wrote this book titled Platform Engineering on Kubernetes. I was giving uh, some copies away uh, for the book, book for the book club, so feel free to check it out. And again, I'm uh, involved with different open source projects uh, in the CNCF space and outside too. So you know, if you have any interest, like if you're interested in these topics, please check the book out. Yeah, and I'm Thomas Vitali. I work at Systematic, a Danish software company. I'm a software engineer and CNCF ambassador. I'm really passionate about anything uh, cloud native or Java related, and combined these passions of mine and wrote a book recently. It's called Cloud Native Spring in Action. Uh, I'm also really a big supporter of open source technologies, contributing as much as I can both in the cloud native ecosystem and in the Java space. So let's get started and analyze a bit more of the challenges that we uh, face, in particular developers face, when onboarding a new process, because there's always a risk to int introduce more complexity. So, for example, how do uh, development teams boost up a new project. How much will it take to go from the initial idea to some prototype? We need to consider that. So how much time are they going to spend before they are able to write the first line of code implementing business logic? So how much boilerplate is there to, to deal with during the boarding yeah, process? Good question. And then uh, an important question also uh, the platform team should uh, ask uh, themselves is, do we want to enforce Kubernetes for local development? And if we do, how are we going to set that up? Will it be a local Kubernetes cluster running on the developer machine? Will it be a remote cluster that each developer gets access to? And how about uh, uh, multi-tenancy? So we, we need to consider this part because it will have a huge impact on the developer experience. And then, of course, we need to containerize applications at some point. How are we going to do that? Are we going to use some Docker files? How are we going to control that centrally from the platform team if we need to patch some security vulnerabilities, for example? There are challenges there as well. And next step, 
we need to configure the deployment and it will be different on a local environment, especially if we use Kubernetes also locally and uh, in production will be, again, very different. How much detail from Kubernetes are we exposing to developers? That's another important uh, challenge we need to face when we uh, design this end-to-end -end experience on top of Kubernetes. And finally, uh, when we put all these uh, pieces uh, of the puzzle together, we should evaluate how much cognitive load are we adding to developers that are using the platform. If it's too much, then we have to iterate through our design and start over and try to fix those areas that are affecting badly uh, the developer experience. Yeah, it's kind of funny because we are here, we all know Kubernetes, right? And we all went through that learning curve where we just understand how it works and then we can use it, right? But think about like new people coming out fresh out of college, all the stuff that they need to learn, it's kind of like insane. So yeah. thinking about how to reduce that is it's quite important. And here we're really talking about a very simple application. Mm -hmm. Like it's just three simple applications in a distributed system. How much work will it be required by developers to run this locally? Yeah. So that's one of the questions we'll try to answer today. Yeah. Go to the next one. The next one is like a little bit more closer to developers and also to infra actually. Is how you decouple infrastructure from application uh, code, right? Like the main idea here is that no matter how the application looks like, it will always be always be storing data or just exchanging events. And in this case, we are storing data in two different you know uh, components, Redis and PostgreSQL. Both requires to have clients or drivers to be able to connect from the application, right? Imagine in this case we have the mobile application in Java and the worker application in C Sharp. They are both, both using the Redis client, but those are two different versions of the Redis client written in different languages. Right? The fact that we need to connect to Redis basically means that we are just coupling these components together in a way. Right? Like now we need to make sure that the Redis client works with the Redis instance that is running on the same version, and the Redis client in the worker written in a different language also needs to work with that specific version. If we want to upgrade Redis, maybe we will need to re-release these two applications. And then the life cycle of these things gets much more complicated. Uh, the same happens when you configure you know, the clients themselves to connect to an instance. Connect, uh, configuring the Java client and the, the C Sharp client might be different. The defaults might be different, so these applications might behave differently when things go wrong. If the Redis instance is misbehaving for some reason, or the Redis clients are configured in a different way, they will behave differently, and then debugging and troubleshooting that takes a lot of time. Most of the times, like developers, right? Yeah, exactly. The next thing uh, around like building distributed architectures, the same that I mentioned already, like the versions in the infrastructure, but also where that infrastructure lives. Where are these instances running? Are they like remotely located? Are they managed services? How do I access that when I'm just doing my development tasks? Do I have a Docker Compose to run them? And what happens if my Docker Compose have different versions of these components that the one that I am using in production? Then we are introducing all these mismatches that we'll need to deal with at some point, right? Uh, so, yeah, so in general, like, you know, even for simple applications, we are, we are running infrastructure. Like, applications doesn't run alone. It's not our code alone. We need to run other components. There is coupling between the environment with this com where these components are running and the application code. And again, same versions using uh, clients that are written in different languages can be the main cause of disruptions and, and troubleshooting issues that can spend like that people will need to spend a lot of time dealing with. Uh, Event-driven scenarios. Uh, this is like very common if you're building distributed system. Again, like exchanging events across systems, it's it's a pretty common pattern. And if you're building platforms, you actually need to enable developers with certain tools to enable these scenarios. Uh, when you build like event-driven applications, uh, the idea is that you can extend the overall application functionality by emitting events and consuming events from different services in a very decoupled way. But as you can see here, we also need a RabbitMQ client. We're using RabbitMQ to emit events every time that we cast a vote. Uh, and that will actually, again, just take us to that scenario where we are coupling all the producers and consumers in a way because they all need to have the RabbitMQ client configured in the same way and upgraded if we are upgrading the RabbitMQ instance. So again, it's like it's not like a very, very strong coupling, but it's a coupling at the end. And if you want to upgrade RabbitMQ, you will need to release all these services. Again, sometimes there are some cases where you don't have the client available for a piece of infrastructure, and then you just need to start rewriting services and all that kind of stuff. Event-driven things, event-driven like the event-driven patterns and interactions are pretty com common in the you know, cloud native space, and I think that we should help teams to basically promote teams to, to, to build more applications like that. 
Uh, but again, there are like uh, several coupling there between producers and consumers, and you know, and misconfigurations will happen. One thing that I want to mention about message brokers and that space of event-driven space is that, again, it's like when I think about like cognitive load of people learning uh, how to change our applications. In this case, this very simple application should be pretty easy to change by someone that who is starting, you know, with with software engineering. But it's actually not if you are using something like Kafka, Kafka that you need to learn about how Kafka works, how you need to configure it, and how to use it. Like the APIs are not as simple as just publish a message, consume a message. They are like around that space, but it's, it's not something that you will learn in a single day. And finally, uh, complex service orchestrations, right? Like the more complex your application is, the more that you will need to orchestrate things against different services, and this is not just calling three services in a sequence. I'm not calling three things in a sequence. Maybe I need to call an internal service that requires certain you know, certificates or maybe you know, credentials, and then I need to wait for a, a person to just tell me that I can proceed with something, and that, that person might be on a holiday, so I just need to wait for that to happen for a long period of time. And then maybe I need to connect to an external system that it charges me for every transaction that I do. So I need to make sure that I'm not spamming that service and I'm not just spending a lot of money in doing so. Those complex orchestrations are usually hard and you need to start figuring out which libraries will help you to, to, to deal with that kind of things. Like, you know, retrying uh, libraries in different languages that, again, can be configured differently and how are you going to handle errors consistently across different languages is also a common problem that I've seen. So, yep, the same thing that I've just said. It's not as simple as calling three REST services one after the other. Sometimes we need to have like custom retries, circuit breakers, or domain-specific uh, logic hooks where you can inject a specific logic in an easy, in an easy way. Uh, we need to deal with long-running things, right? Like these interactions, these orchestrations can be across like different days, months, or years. And we need a way to compensate when things go wrong, right? Like maybe we, we are calling a system that, uh, you know, it's like making a debit out from my, uh, my bank account. And then, well, for some reason, you know, we need to undo things. So we need to have the right mechanisms to implement these, these operations. Yeah, and once we are done architecting yeah. the distributed system, we need to go to production, of course. Otherwise, our application will not produce any value until it's there, right? So we need to address other challenges. Yeah. So how do we roll out uh, new deployments safely? Uh, do we have a backup option? Can we uh, roll back <coughs> deployments? Uh, do we need something like progressive delivery or maybe mm -hmm. some canary deployments yeah. to uh, slowly test the new version of the application just to a small amount of users? Mm -hmm. uh, and then how about auto-scaling? Because there's both a, a cost optimization point of view, but also an environmentally friendly aspect to scale to zero applications. And that's actually pretty easy to do, scaling to zero. The challenging part is scaling from zero, because the platform needs to support that somehow. It needs to intercept that request and spin up a new instance of, of the, the application. Mm -hmm. And the application also needs to be designed in a way that can support processing the request immediately, so without waiting too much time during the startup before it's actually active and ready to process a new request coming in. Good. And then the, all the configuration specific to the application, where do we place that? Is it a developer responsibility, or is it the platform that can support that? Uh, so are we building a, an application-aware platform, or are we enforcing applications to be platform-aware? Then we need to infer uh, the state of the application from its outputs, like we can't go to production without observability, right? So we need to have the right signals in place and uh, collect them and make them consumable in a way that can help troubleshooting and visualizing what is going on yeah, uh, in the platform and in the application. And then this platform needs to be managed and operated some, some, somehow. So we need to consider that aspect as well. 100%. Yeah, and so we're going to uh, show some solutions about this, but yeah. perhaps we can have a little fun now. Let's have some fun. Let's, let's make it interactive so we don't sleep. Yeah, let's do it. So can you, if you scan that with your phone, uh, again, we are going to be using the app that we showed before. Uh, you are going to be using the app. So try to scan that, and let's uh, play a bit. Uh, we have some prices at the end. I don't want to spoil yes. it. But and yes. Also, we need to settle the debate with Mauricio because I'm more of a cat person. He's yes. more of a dog person. So we oh. need help to find out. Yes. So is it more cats or more dogs? More cats or more dogs? Oh, that's I the think question. I'm gonna lose this. I don't know. I don't know. They are keep like voting. Keep voting. Cats and dogs floating all over cats the place. And dogs, right? Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's insane. So what's going on there? So. A lot of uh, events. A lot of events process, going right? on, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's a tie. Oh, ouch. 
it's very, very close. I would say that it's very, very close. And you can keep boarding, of course. So this is nice. Okay. Yes, it is. So, so basically, this application is, gone, is running on Kubernetes, of course. It's running on Google Cloud. We make it public. And uh, we actually are using a bunch of tools to solve some of the challenges that we mentioned before. Please don't close the application. You have like a hash on top. We will use that later on in the presentation. Uh, but I just want to keep seeing kind of like the yes. cats and dogs floating yeah, It's kind around. of nice to look at. It's just, just really nice. Uh, look at it in the big screen. That's it insane. Makes happy. Let's switch back to the presentation. But should we, should hmm? we unfold what's going on under the hood? Yes. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about the tools that we are using. So that's how the architecture looks like, right? Yeah, like, oh, that, that, that's a lot of things going on there. That's a very, very high level view of the things that we are using. We're using a bunch of open source projects, CNCF projects, to get this up and running. Again, it's running on Google Cloud, but you can run the same application in any cloud provider, actually. Uh, but because this is a little bit complicated to look at, let, let's break it down. Yeah, let's break it down. Yep. So let's we want to unlock, unlock new platform experiences. Exactly. And the first challenge we mentioned was around onboarding new projects. So first of all, we want to bootstrap a new project. And there are different ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. But we want to minimize the time from a development team getting a new idea to develop uh, till they are able to write the first line of code implementing business logic. Mm -hmm. And of course, a popular way building on Kubernetes is using backstage software templates functionality. So in this case, we have an example of a Java application. We integrated already with Dapper based on the Spring Boot framework. Mm -hmm. So a development team can go there and bootstrap a new application. and focusing immediately on the business logic. Yeah, if you have like the C-sharp team or the Go team just having yes. similar templates, then you just can make it really easy. And really find some golden path for, uh, for the development team. So we can accelerate mm -hmm. the onboarding and bootstrapping phase. Yep. But at some point, we have to containerize uh, the application, of course. And as I mentioned earlier, Docker files have some uh, downsides. So perhaps we want to use cloud native build packs. So okay. from a platform, platform perspective, we can centralize uh, all the rules and how we uh, containerize applications, and developers get a nice experience. Because yep. whatever the language they're using in their application, then with one command, they can obtain a container image. It's a production-ready container image uh, designed for security and performance in mind. And you can use the pack CLI that comes with the project and make it part of your pipelines. Or running on Kubernetes, you can use the Kubernetes native implementation. It's called KPAC. So you can actually make a build service, a centralized build service. Mm -hmm. And as a platform team, you can centralize, for example, rolling out new patch updates. So one of the capabilities of Cloud Native Build Packs is being able to rebase patch. the image. So without having to recompile and talk to all the development teams, centrally, you can replace just the bottom layer of the image. Maybe there's a, a vulnerability in the operating system layer. Yeah. And you can do it centrally. Mm -hmm. But there are other uh, ways of doing that, of course, because if we say one option is not requiring Kubernetes to run locally for development teams, yep. we still need to provide integrations. We talked about yep. we have Postgres, RabbitMQ. We have different integrations. So a great tool of dealing with that is test containers. Mm -hmm. With test containers, uh, you can have support for different languages again, because we really mm -hmm. want to establish a polyglot uh, design, right? Mm -hmm. So test containers support Java, Golang, Ruby, uh, uh, C Sharp, mm -hmm. and can make it part of the application lifecycle, uh, the management of all these uh, integrations and services that yep. the application needs, both at development time and for integration testing. Yep. Another tool that can help if you're working with functions specifically is KNAD functions mm -hmm. that actually combines different tools to provide an end-to-end -end experience. Yep. So it has a, a bootstrapping capability. So instead of using Backstage, you can use KNAD functions pointing to a template. You get a new project bootstrapped. Under the hood, it also uses Cloud Native Build Packs to containerize applications. And also for deployment, it uses Knative Serving. Yeah. So you get one entry point to deal with the entire life cycle of the application, which is pretty, pretty good for functions, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, we can have also a better experience when we work with pipelines. Mm -hmm. And for example, Dagger, yeah. that lets you implement pipelines using normal programming languages. I wonder how many people was like in the app developer con session that we did the other day. So basically, we were showing how to automate the same application with some Dagger pipelines uh, for local development experiences. So pipelines that you can run in your laptop and in CI. It was pretty interesting. If you don't see the, if you didn't see the presentation, just look for the recording. I think that yeah. it was covered there. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, we have the onboarding phase done. Yep. Developers are building their application. Yeah. But I guess we still need to address the challenge of how we deal with state in a distributed system. Dealing with the state is, is important. I think that this is kind of like the part of like cloud native distributed challenges. Uh, I think that we can agree that like we spent a lot of time at the beginning of the presentation talking about like this separation between infrastructure and application code. I believe that this will help teams to go faster. And for that, we are using basically APIs. 
And that's what the Dapper project is about. The Dapper project will give you that separation of concerns between infrastructure that you're using and application code. So from the application point of view, you will have APIs to interact with the infrastructure. Do you want to send a message? Do you want to store some data? You will use this, those APIs instead of contact, like interacting directly with Redis, PostgreSQL, or RabbitMQ in this way. Having APIs, of course, as you might know, is, is really important also because then you can have different implementations, which takes me to the second image, where if we are running on Google Cloud, maybe we want to use Google uh, PubSub instead of you know, RabbitMQ because it's a managed service, so I don't need to run it myself. I can just use the managed service. If I can pay for it, I, I might, might use that, right? Uh, the same with, the, with Redis or the Google uh, in-memory store, right? It's the same API, so I can actually replace the implementations and move my application across environments without changing the code. And we have, uh, you know, the Dapper project has different implementations for different providers. So you can use you know, DynamoDB in AWS to uh, just to store data instead of using PostgreSQL. Again, using managed services and having this API that allows your applications to move across environments without changes, I think it's, it's pretty... Uh, like, it's, it's a good thing uh, to do, right? Again, because we have one, one, more, one more thing, because we have APIs there that gives us the possibility of tapping into observability of how our applications are accessing this infrastructure, so you can extract data and see that in Grafana, something that we will do yeah. later on, right? Do that shortly. But when we talk about, like, states and integrations, there are, like, some very well-known cloud-native patterns that we can actually start, like, relying out of the box, right? Like, something that I mentioned, and when you see cats and dogs flying around the screen, that's basically some RabbitMQ messages that are being sent to the dashboard, right? Like, not to the dashboard, but to RabbitMQ, and the dashboard is consuming those, uh, those messages. This is a very common thing to do where you want to store a state and then emit an event, right? Like, this is a very common thing that developers will do. And we need to make sure that that's easier for developers. But something very common in these scenarios is that you might want to only send a message if you uh, are guaranteed that the information was stored in, the, in this case in Redis, right? Like the moment that I commit the information in Redis, I want to emit a message. If I cannot commit the information in, in Redis, I don't want to emit that message, right? We want to have some sort of control doing that. And in, if you take a look into the Dapper APIs that I'm using in the, in the application, we can check quickly uh, how is that looking like, right? So I have here the save state uh, API. This is basically uh, the Dapper APIs, and I'm using the Dapper client to access this from a Java application. I don't know if you can see that. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm calling the save state operation, and then uh, I'm checking if the, you know, the messaging side is available, I will publish an event, right? That's what a, a developer will usually do, right? This doesn't warranty any kind of transactions. It's just wait for something to be saved and then uh, submit it there. What I can do with Dapper is also use transactions. So I have a way to list operations that will be executed in the same transaction, no matter which infrastructure I'm using down below for messaging or for storing a state. So that's kind of like it's building on functionality and common patterns that we know. And as you can see here, uh, I am just, uh, just have a list of transactional operations that I want to execute. I want to uh, create a new state, basically store the vote into a persistent storage, in this case it's Redis, and then I will execute that transaction uh, to the configured state store that I'm using. Something that you are not seeing here is that I'm emitting an event, because again, the Dapper project gives you uh, that functionality of implementing common patterns, and what you can do there is that you can configure these to happen at the infrastructure level. So instead of saying, you know, I will push the developer to code and codify when to send events, I can configure Dapper to say every time that uh, a state is stored, no matter the persistent store, I want to emit an event into, uh, you know, a, a queue in this case, right? And that's quite interesting the with the Java application specifically because using RabbitMQ, exactly. actually RabbitMQ doesn't come with that kind of transactional support mm -hmm. where we are using a pattern like Saga where we want to save some state and we want to also publish a message. So we're not getting a better experience with Dabber, but actually we managed to do something that is not possible with the plain RabbitMQ client in this case, yeah. and getting the transactional uh, guarantee. Exactly. And that takes us to the next slide where like, that's the... What, that's what we want to achieve. And the next one, basically, it's the name of the pattern. It's called the Outbox pattern. And you can just look for it in the Dapper documentation because it's pretty that simple to just store transactionally some state, and it will automatically produce a message for you without complicating the, you know, the, the, the code with transactions and, and, and more complicated stuff. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when you, are like, when you can do these basic functionalities like storing state, sending and consuming events, the next step is like what we discussed before, like more complex service orchestrations where you need to, for example, uh, 
let's pick a winner between cats and dogs, right? And then uh, ask, for, uh, ask for the audience to see if the winner is around. But we don't want to be waiting there forever. So we can have a timer to say, you know, if like, the winner is not in the audience, then uh, we will just do something else. If the winner is in the audience, then we can give the winner a prize. And if the winner is actually not coming to pick up the prize, then we might need to pick another winner because it's like we have a non comparative you know, a winner. So yeah, and then finally, you need to coordinate with an external service, for example, saving the winner into the Hall of Fame that might be a store in a different cloud provider like Azure, right? We want to do all that complex coordination, and we can do that again with uh, Dapper workflows with this kind of like one of the newest additions to the, to the framework that will give you a programmatic way to basically codify those interactions. Again, I don't have time to show all the, uh, the implementation. Again, this is Java, but this can be implemented in any language, you know, again, using common APIs. And we have like here, like a workflow, calling activities in this case, like picking a winner activity and then waiting for events. You can see how easy it is to say, I'm waiting for this event, but uh, with, the, like, uh, with the timer for five minutes, right? Like if it's not coming in five minutes, then I have the way to say, well, now I need to go and do something else, just do plan B, for example, or, or whatever you want to do. Again, very friendly for programmers, like for developers, because they will have an API to create these complex interactions. Let me go back to the Zoom. Here, meetings, there you go. Yeah, so let's talk about how we can solve some challenges when going to production. Yep. So first of all, uh, we want to uh, auto-scale our application. So all of you were voting. So we're going to see in a minute if uh, we needed to auto-scale actually the application, right? Yeah. Or if it was enough on Replica to sustain all the load mm -hmm. of all the voting. Yep. And we're using Knative Serving for doing that. And uh, so we can do auto-scaling, scaling to zero, and most importantly, scaling from zero. And then we have applications that, of course, need to be ready to be run in a serverless environment. So for example, with Java, we can use GraalVM native compilation in order to get instant startup time and reduce memory consumption. Good and then we can use CADA because Knative Serving is uh, providing auto-scaling, but for HTTP-based requests. Mm -hmm. So if we want to do the same for event-driven uh, calls or transactions, yeah. then we can use CADA. And we can pair them together uh, by themselves, or we can even use a higher level project like Open Function that brings them together and provide yeah. an overall function runtime and lifecycle management. Yeah. I, if you don't know about Open Functions, it's a very interesting project that basically combines Knative Serving, CADA, Dapper, uh, build packs, and a bunch of other things just to provide that functions experience. Uh, if you are really into functions, you should take a look. Uh, it's not easy. Because, again, it's combining a lot of projects together, so you kind of need to understand how it works. But I think that it's a pretty good thing to, to look into. Yeah. Good. And then we have the platform. So in this case, we use Carvel to package each capability as an OCI artifact. Mm -hmm. And then everything is bundled as one uh, big package that can be installed on any environment with one command. Uh, we have Flux for uh, doing some continuous deployment of all our application workloads and to manage all the uh, different uh, data services as well. Uh, yeah. And then open telemetry, because observability is really, really important. We can't yeah. go in production without observability. And open telemetry provides these unified APIs and protocol with support across different languages. Mm -hmm. So again, we want to ensure this polyglot experience across the entire life cycle of an application. And maybe we can have a look. Let's yeah. see what happens. Let's take a look. Uh, when you take yes, you go. thank you. So I'm really curious. So you need to go to the cuts. Yes. And the, yeah, there. All right. First of all, let's see. Thank you. Let's see about Knative. Mm -hmm. And we have the vote service. So we had some concurrency here last, let's say, last 30 minutes. So that's pretty nice. So we actually didn't need to scale. So we got yeah. more concurrency, you can see, in this area. But one pod was still enough. Mm -hmm. So we actually uh, did some load testing here. We used DDoSify to DDoS our application. Yeah. And that was really cool. At some point, we had more than 1,000 pods. <laughs> yeah. And it was like we a... got the cluster auto-scaling as well. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty neat. Yeah. Well, just because we did the DDoS attack, I guess. Yeah, DDoS attack. Like <laughs> that good otherwise. There you but, go. Uh, ah, there you go. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, we're using Dapper, so we are abstracting all these APIs. But under the hood, we still have a concrete implementation. So for the message broker, we are using RabbitMQ. So mm -hmm. let's see if it's actually using RabbitMQ, right? So I can go and check in the RabbitMQ. So we can see we have a dashboard here. And we can see messages incoming and outgoing from RabbitMQ. So from a developer perspective, I'm only dealing with the Dapper client. 
and uh, sending and consuming messages in a um, neutral way from the application. Yeah. And then under the hood, the platform team then would uh, uh, pick the implementation for that type of service uh, underlying Dapper. It could be RabbitMQ, it could be yeah. Kafka. And for me, it's actually convenient because like, I know RabbitMQ, I'm familiar yeah. with it, I can run it. But then if you switch with Kafka, maybe I would have problems. So actually, yeah. using Dapper would help me so I don't yeah. have to learn all the details of how uh, Kafka works internally. Yeah, and I think that this is pretty important, at least from a platform engineering uh, space, is that we will have observability at all the layers, right? Like application layer, looking at how the application is using infrastructure in a generic way but also like at the infrastructure, all the dashboards for the specific uh, yeah. tools that we are using. So it yeah. might be time yeah. to wrap up. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think that like the, the main things that, that we wanted to show here in this presentation is that APIs are usually important. Like choosing the right APIs if you are building your platforms is really a good way to help to protect your platform investments, right? Like you need to figure out where do you need to wrap everything up with your personal, like your domain specific interfaces. And when you're doing that, like looking into standards and open source projects will help you a lot, right? Like people in the open source communities here in the CNCF, we are spending a lot of time like solving common challenges for across like the entire industry. And those standards and APIs are being created. So if you're interested in joining these, uh, these, these movements, just please join the specific working groups. Uh, we need to actually speed up the onboarding processes that we have nowadays uh, with all these tools and with all the ecosystem. So try to always aim for reducing cognitive load and try to improve the integrations between the tools. Uh, we have used a lot of tools here, and I think that because we knew the tools, we were kind of like, okay, efficient enough, but for people that doesn't know those tools, you need to make the process simpler. Uh, look for out-of-the-box cloud-native patterns, right? Again, if you're building very complex distributed applications, you need to have the right tools in place to not push developers to solve these common challenges. And finally, like smooth operations, I guess that have observa observability all over the place so you can troubleshoot when things go wrong. And uh, I don't know if you want to add something else there. Yeah, so I think we tested uh, yeah. a few things from the distributed system. We tested storing the state, reading mm -hmm. the state. We uh, tested also exchanging messages, but we didn't test the service uh, orchestration workflow. Maybe we should test that? Maybe we can test, test that. And I have two books here. Let's see how the cats and dogs are doing. Uh, yeah, you have a code on uh, your phone if you kept the window open. Yeah, so if you have it open there, I can see more boats coming. But what I'm going to do here, if it, if it works, uh, there is a button there just to choose a winner. I don't know like the results. What are the results? I just don't even see my mouse. Yeah, it's a lot of cats and dogs. Dogs are winning. Uh, the counter is not working. I'm, apologies for that. I thought that it was working. It's not. <laughs> but like, look at that. That's, that's pretty wild. OK. Yeah, I don't know if we'll be able to settle. One no, more, I don't uh, think that we can settle. Dogs. No, we cannot settle that. So let's start with cats. I yes. will give you that. So okay. let's, let's pick I'm a winner. This is where the demo can go really, really wrong. But like, drum rolls. There you go. Let's see. Let's wait. A there you go. We have a winner. So is the winner in the audience? Let's see. Is the winner in the audience? <laughs> yeah, there it is. We have a Where winner. Where is it? Yes, uh, yes. You need, to, you need to come to pick your book. So yes. let's mark it. The winner is in the audience. That the winner yes. get a book. He's coming. I will say that he got the book, right? Yeah, yes. So if he's coming, that's good. He will get the book. Yeah, let's pick a second one. And we can do like the dogs one. So drum rolls again. There you go. Uh, there there you it go. is. Another winner. It's in the audience. Is it in the audience? Uh, there we have it there. <laughs> there you All go. Right. It kind of worked. I'm, That's I'm great. amazed. And that was the service orchestration. Thank you very much, guys. So yes, books. And that's it? Yes. Let's uh, close this up. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, thank you very much for joining. Mauricio, tomorrow will be uh, K -native uh, functions. the K-Native uh, yeah. Functions talk. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to join, and we'll be around for questions. And Thank in the QR code, you can check the source code as well. Thank you. Have a great day. Good stuff.